So a very warm welcome to this In Conversation with Professor Lucinda Platt. Lucinda, I know you as colleague and friend, and I'm delighted to have this chance to talk with you about your research, and especially how that research has fed into some of the major social policy issues of our time. And in the time we have, I'd really like to take you on a, a bit of a journey through your career to see just how those early desires to better understand the world we live in and do something to help the most vulnerable set you on a path to this point where your research and expertise are being called on as we face one of the biggest crises of our time in the form of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course. So I, I wonder if I can start by asking you then how an English graduate from Cambridge goes on to study at Oxford to become a social worker and then moves into academia. Yeah, so I think that's uh, that's an interesting question that I sometimes reflect on myself. So I got to the end of my undergraduate studies and realised that um, my love of Anglo-Saxon literature was probably not something that um, opened up very many um, job opportunities. So I had to sort of re reflect and think about where I went from there. And, um, you know, like many um, uh, idealistic 20-somethings, um, I, I thought I wanted to Make the world a better place to change the world um, and I um, uh, engaged in a lot of um, adult literacy and adult numeracy teaching over the course of the um, following year um, and through that I sort of came to the conclusion that uh, um, social work and um, helping people who are in difficult circumstances was somewhere I wanted to wanted to be uh, so then I trained as a social worker and I worked as a community worker and social worker um, for a little while um, and um, during that time, I then also came to, came, came to a much fuller understanding of sort of some of the structural inequalities that um, meant that people were in difficult circumstances. I did a lot of work around race equality. Um, and I thought that I really wanted to go into some of these issues in more depth. Um, and I had the opportunity then to um, work as a researcher and also study for a PhD. Uh, so I took that opportunity. I studied as, um, for a sociology PhD. Um, and I also from I can carried on with my literacy teaching um, because I was uh, um, very aware, um, became very aware that teaching was something I really liked. So I thought an academic career enabled me to go into some of these issues in greater depth in the way I wanted to and bring a sociological understanding to them, but also would enable me to to, to fulfill my enjoyment of teaching um, and engage with undergraduates. Yeah, that's a perfect link to my next question for you, really, because uh, although you went on to lecture in sociology for the early part of your university career, you always held, held this key interest in social policy. So what is it about social policy that's always interested you and which indeed still motivates your you and your work today? So I think it's sometimes said that uh, sociologists are very good at identifying um, problems and social people who do social policy are much better at identifying solutions. So I suppose the, you know, the, the intellectual interest in sort of the sociological analysis um, never seemed quite sufficient to me and that this continual identification of problems or problematizing of issues uh, didn't seem to take us much further ahead and, and it didn't really um, uh, uh, link entirely to the sort of the, um, uh, the practical uh, aspects of um, understanding of inequalities in society uh, that had informed both why I went into social work and also why I undertook a PhD in the first place. So um, I, I, I did teach um, social policy um, while I was, um, uh, as, as a sociologist, when I was in the sociology department. Um, and gradually I wanted to move much more in the direction of, of working on social policy and working much more closely with policy makers in trying to you know, use my um, uh, academic skills in that way. Now, I don't really feel that we can talk about your research without mentioning the word longitudinal study. And uh, you played a key role in helping to establish the UK household longitudinal study known as Understanding Society, which tracks the lives of 40,000 households in the UK. And you've also been responsible for the management of the Millennium Cohort Study, which has followed some 20,000 children born in and around the millennium. So tell us a bit about the role these studies have played in your work and why you continue to be such a champion of them. So my interest in longitudinal research went back to my PhD, where in fact I used um, administrative data to study transitions of um, children in and out of poverty over time. And it uh, struck me at the time, I, I became very committed to and passionate about the idea that actually we understand much more about people's lives if we can follow them, if we can track movements, um, and if we can understand phenomena like poverty, not as something that happens at one point in time, but something that has cumulative effects, cumulative effects over time. Um, so that uh, so that 
because that was a, um, an original interest. And then when I was at Essex, which was the home of the British Household Panel Survey, which was the, a longitudinal study, which was a predecessor to understanding society, I did some work on that. But um, the British Household Panel Survey had a rather smaller sample than understanding society and wasn't able to look at ethnic differences, which was a key interest of mine. And so when understanding society um, was being um, initiated, um, I had the opportunity to get involved and very much develop it as a study um, which was a sort of expanded British Household pan Panel study, but also one where we could look at um, ethnic differences by including an oversample of ethnic minority groups. Um, and so some of these core interests of transitions could be tracked not just for the general population, but also for um, ethnic minority populations. Um, and um, I, I, I continue to work with Understanding Society. I continue to be a co-investigator and I lead on the um, ethnicity and immigration strand of that study. Um, but those experiences also led me to the Millennium Cohort study. I studied child poverty for my PhD, as I mentioned, and the Millennium Cohort study was a study of children. I was very interested in children's welfare um, and um, carried out quite a lot of analysis around children's experience. Uh, so the Millennium Cohort was in a sense a dream job, both running a longitudinal study myself and also being able to um, um, analyze the data as part of that role um, and think about what the implications of that were for children's lives in today's society. A lot of work and I wonder if you could um, just in the short time we have really highlight a piece of research using one of those studies perhaps that somehow uh, really impacted on social policy in some way um, and where you can say clearly how it's benefited people more widely. A difficult question I know. Yes, it is always difficult to track one's research into uh, actual differences to people's lives. Um, I suppose um, one example from um, analysis of the Millennium Cohort study was some work I did with um, colleagues with Stella Katsukahari and uh, Sam Parsons on um, child disability, um, child disability and specifically um, bullying experience uh, in school. And uh, I did, we did this work partly as a result of um, a collaboration with the Council for Disabled Children. Um, and their uh, young disabled children were saying to, or young disabled people, sort of older children, were telling us that one of the key issues um, for them was the experience of bullying. And we, um, we hadn't initially um, incorporated a study of bullying into this research project. We were thinking about children's behavior, we were thinking about their educational attainment, but not bullying. But we felt we should respond to this and analyze whether there were different differential experiences of bullying of dis for disabled children. And I think somewhat to our surprise, um, and it was to our surprise because, of course, the children who are disabled are also um, more likely to be from a low socioeconomic group. Um, they're more likely to be young for the year. They're not so likely to be um, excelling educationally. Um, so we thought that all these factors um, might be what drove the bullying experience of disabled children. But in fact, even when we factored those out, even when we controlled for those, we found that disabled children were more likely to be bullied. And this was younger children and slightly older children. So with the young children, we were using the Millennium Cohort Study to look at that. Um, and the reason why I think this was um, important and potentially influential was um, that uh, while um, the Council of Disabled Children were saying, yes, we know that disabled children are bullied more, they up to that point had no concrete evidence, no sort of quantitative evidence that this, that this actually happened and that they could take um, to policymakers they could use in their work with schools. Um, so that's, that's, I think, what perhaps... Um, one example that I would like to highlight yeah, most. Fantastic stuff. Now, your social policy expertise has been sought uh, widely in recent years by charities, think tanks, government departments, particularly around uh, ethnic inequality, poverty and education, as you've been talking about. How would you define your expertise and how are you able to help these different groups through the work you do? So in terms of defining my expertise, I would say um, I would define myself as a quantitative sociologist. Um, so um, uh, the ability to um, analyze uh, data sets and produce robust evidence, but very much sociologically informed, um, which sort of contrasts quite a lot with a lot of the um, uh, economic evidence that informs policy as well. Also very important, but perhaps less pays less attention to the, to the structures within society which shape experiences and has a more individual point of view. So in terms of uh, what I can offer to sort of policymakers and uh, those who've, who've um, uh, sought my input, uh, 
one one aspect is simply the analysis and here for example i was um commissioned by the department for work and pensions uh, some years ago to do um, analysis of child poverty and ethnicity uh, which up to that point very little had been known about and so I was bringing together lots of different data sources to look at what the picture was and the differences in child poverty and that uh, that fed into work that was currently ongoing on the um, Child Poverty Act which um, was then um, implemented in 2010. Um, and now I think more um, within government departments, there's kind of an interest um, also in, in, in having more information in, in simply sort of educating policymakers themselves about what the issues are and the different ways of thinking about it. And so I'm sometimes asked by um, the Treasury chief economist from the Treasury or from other government departments to sort of provide some sort of um, overview of, of a topic um, such as um, immigration or ethnic inequalities or the relationship between COVID and ethnic inequalities is a very current example. Let's talk specifically now Lucinda about the IFS Deaton review on inequality in the 21st century of which you're an expert panel member. Um, what would you say has been your contribution to the review and how has COVID featured there? So the um, IFS Deaton review of inequality I think is a, is a really far reaching and fundamental review of inequality in the UK but putting it in, a, in an international perspective as well. So I think it's destined to be a really sort of important reference to how we understand inequalities into society at a time when there is much greater concern about and attention, I think, now to inequality, um, both, in, both um, inequalities sort of across the distribution of income and wealth, inequalities within labour markets, but inequalities across different groups, such as um, women, um, ethnic minorities, um, immigrant populations, and so on. Um, so it was very exciting to be invited to be involved as a panel member um, and to help with sort of commissioning evidence chapters and to contribute to shaping those. My contribution has, has been a lot in sort of identifying who might be um, involved as um, chapter authors or commentators to provide expert insight into particular areas um, and also who could provide commentaries that set the UK evidence in a, a more international context, um, particularly in the areas of immigration, race and ethnicity, um, gender and disability. Yeah, a really important project to, to be involved with. Um, you co-authored an editorial in 2020 last year, as, as we speak today, called COVID-19 and Ethnic Minorities, an urgent agenda for overdue action. What was your message there? So this was a short piece, but one which was really picking up on the um, increasing evidence that had been building up, some of which I helped to produce with my colleague Ross Warwick, about the fact that the impacts of a COVID were not equally distributed across the population. Um, and that ethnic minorities were disproportionately likely to both um, uh, die from COVID um, when you adjusted for the age, um, age distribution, and also they were disproportionately likely to be economically affected. And the message here was really that this shouldn't be seen as something that was um, new or coincidental, uh, that we have known for a long time about ethnic inequalities um, and the sort of surprise in a sense with which these um, uh, findings were uh, greeted um, seem to be denying the fact that um, we've known for a long time, for example, that people are uh, working um, in um, Certain ethnic minority groups are working in jobs which were more likely to be affected by um, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, whether in terms of exposure to the disease through care work um, or whether through the economic consequences through working in, for example, the hospitality sector. So these, these uh, negative impacts were, in a sense, um, in many ways predictable um, and that it shouldn't need to take um, uh, a pandemic to suddenly raise them up the agenda. Mm, point very well made. Now you've also produced a, a briefing on the impact of COVID on children with special educational needs. What, what were the key takeaways from that particular piece of work? So this um, again builds on one of my key interests in, in the experience of disabled children and, and adults um, and how they are um, often uh, sort of marginalised in provision and even I think in, in some of the, uh, the, the academic research we do that there is not always as much attention to disability as there is to some other um, areas of people's lives. Um, and what we were saying here was we were identifying the extent to which um, the experience of COVID, COVID was different for those who had been um, had disabled in childhood or had special educational needs. Um, 
there was uh, um, some anecdotal evidence, but not very much again systematic evidence that um, uh, uh, the impacts of uh, how the impacts of COVID were playing out across uh, lives of children with special educational needs. Um, and we've had a mixture of findings. We found that they were more likely to be in adult life, uh, to be more economically impacted by COVID, but also that um, some of the um, issues around loneliness and isolation were interestingly for this particular age group, which was young adults who had disability, um, were not so severe. And we think this is maybe partly that the, the fact of people having to be at home more was actually for those who couldn't participate in the labour market or had limited access to jobs or were disadvantaged in employment um, was actually not so negative as it was to some other young people. Uh, so in a sense, they would have more siblings around them. What we weren't able to get at, and I think which is remains the, the sort of really pressing issue is, is the experience of actual school children um, who have been um, affected by the lockdowns and by being out of school. Um, and the what um, anecdotally we hear are kind of some very, very negative experiences for them, disruption to their schedules and so on. Um, and I think really this, this, is a, this is an area which deserves much more attention than it's currently getting. Yes, indeed. Um, so more work to come by the sounds of things in, the, in that area, potentially. Um, so all this fabulous work, Lucinda, meant that in 2020, um, you were awarded the OBE in the Queen's New Year's Honours List. And I seem to remember from an exchange we had that it came as something uh, of a surprise and that you narrowly missed the deadline to accept. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, these things always come as a surprise, don't they? I, I, I mean, I was, I was, I was, um, I was uh, rather shocked. I think, uh, yes. So I was uh, actually um, uh, in Australia at the time. I was on sabbatical, and um, it was only fortuitously uh, that somebody who was um, uh, collecting collecting the post uh, for me spotted that um, this might be a piece of post that I was interested in. Um, so then I had to very hastily um, ask him to open it and uh, and then respond and, and accept. So there was the sort of initial excitement and then the initial anxiety of the sort of fear of missing out. Have I lost my chance now? So uh, yeah, so it was it was um, it was it was it was, uh, it was very flattering. I was I was touched. And I, I I I thought also um, we think of sort of of, of depths at such times. And I thought um, you know, there's always the thing going through your head. Should you should you as a, as a non-royalist should you accept such a such an award um uh and then you think well what would my mother think and this would make her very happy <laughs> um so uh, yes and I'm, I'm sure she was very happy and indeed very, very proud, as a lot of people are. Um, and I'd really love to finish by asking you, um, after this wonderful conversation, Lucinda, whether you feel that you've fulfilled those very early ambitions to make a difference to the lives of some vulnerable people and groups through your career, or whether there's, as you've rather hinted at, I think, that there's still quite a lot of work to be done. Oh, absolutely. I think there's, there's there's a huge amount of work to be done. And I think one of the things about the COVID pandemic and sort of the um, issues around ethnic inequalities um, in the impact of the COVID pandemic um, gave it a sort of chance to, to reflect a bit more on whether it's time to think less about sort of um, uh, simply academic public publications, but to think much more concretely about how those do um, or can be translated um, into actual policy. So I suppose uh, raising the level of my engagement with um, policymakers as far as I can has been something which um, has become very important to me. Um, and um, not kind of not not leaving behind these these issues about. Um, uh, um, where there is less attention. So the experience, for example, of, of disabled children, if this isn't being paid attention to, how can we get more evidence? How can we raise this up the agenda? Um, how can we continue to address these long-standing issues around ethnic inequalities and attempt to make some more informed choices about policy that will be less discriminatory, uh, have, have a fewer impacts on the most, on those who are more marginal in our societies. So it's not there's no sort of concrete agenda, but I think you know things like involvement in the Deacon Review of Inequality is something I have hopes for. Um, and as I say, then get, uh, taking every opportunity where um, there is a chance to to speak to, to confer with to discuss with policymakers, um, to update their, their knowledge and their evidence um, is, is, is where I see um, what I want to do going forward. Really great stuff, Lucinda. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to go on this journey and to be in conversation with you today. Uh, so for now, Professor Lucinda Platt, thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.